So thank you so much for the kind introduction and the opportunity uh, to be here today to speak with all of you. <clears throat> so for the, the better part of the last decade, my frequent co-author, uh, Jason Schultz, and I have been focused really on one uh, primary question. And the question is, what does it mean to own something in the digital economy? Uh, from the media that we all consume to our own home appliances and vehicles, this is a question, I think, of growing uh, importance in our daily lives. Now, when it comes to traditional analog physical goods, consumers, I think, have a good intuitive understanding of what it means to own something. They understand on a very basic level the rules of personal property, and that, that grows out of really a, a lifetime of personal experience with those kinds of products. But I'm mostly interested in uh, intellectual goods, in information goods. And so intellectual property law sort of complicates the picture there uh, in some important ways. Normally, we think about intellectual property law as governing intangibles. Um, and for authors and inventors, that's often true. For consumers, though, Intellectual property law, in large part, is a set of rules that tell us what we can and can't do with our stuff, with the things that we own. Can we lend or resell our books? Can we repair uh, our home electronics or our vehicles? Uh, do we get to choose the brand of coffee that we brew at home in the morning? Believe it or not, for better or worse, intellectual property law actually has something to say about each of those questions. Now, if you go out and you buy a print book, a hard copy book, um, I'm not here primarily to, to pitch my book, but if you're going to buy it, um, I say buy the hard copy. Why? Uh, well, when you buy a hard copy of a book, it becomes your personal property. It's like your favorite pair of shoes or your toothbrush. You own it. And by virtue of that ownership, you can do a number of valuable things uh, with it. You can keep it forever. You can read it as many times as you want. You can give it away. You can resell it. You can leave it to someone in your will. Uh, not to bring down the mood, right? But we're all going to die eventually. Um, and what happens with our books uh, at that point, right? Um, those rights that I just described are all a function of this notion of exhaustion. And exhaustion in the law is this principle that once an intellectual property rights holder sells you a particular copy of their work, their right to control how you use it, to control what you do with it after the fact, uh, is reduced and, and exhausted in some very important respects. That's the reason we have used record stores and used bookstores, right? It's the reason we have public libraries uh, in the United States. Um, that do not rely on any ongoing obligation to compensate authors or publishers. It's the reason we have eBay. Uh, this is a principle that is deeply rooted in the law. You can trace this notion of exhaustion back at least about 150 years. Um, and it's a fundamental component of copyright and patent and trademark law. And what it does primarily is it helps define the boundary between the intellectual property law system and the personal property law system. It also provides really crucial incentives for consumers. Right? We're asking consumers to do something counterintuitive in the, in the present day marketplace. We're asking them to pay for things that are available for free. Why would they do that? Well, one reason they would do that is that by paying, consumers acquire a meaningful, reliable set of legal rights, right? the rights of ownership of those particular copies. If we want them to engage in that behavior, it's important uh, to make sure uh, that those rights have real value. Another crucial thing exhaustion does is that it helps maintain low information costs. Right? So the exhaustion rule favors fairly simple, straightforward kinds of transactions. It favors gifts and sales uh, and rentals. And it tends to disfavor more idiosyncratic, more complex transactional forms, the kinds of transactions that are defined uh, by complex license agreements, perhaps. Right? 
those complex license agreements impose real costs on consumers if we actually expect people to read them and understand them. The iTunes license is longer than Macbeth. How many of you have actually read it? Right? There's like three or four of us who have absolutely nothing better to do with our time right, than have, uh, that have read that, uh, that agreement. Right? Uh, so by limiting the transactions to these identifiable, intuitive forms, we reduce the costs for consumers. Exhaustion is also important because it creates a sense of autonomy among consumers, this idea that you can do what you want with your stuff without asking for permission. Uh, it helps protect privacy uh, by allowing you to engage uh, in behavior um, without being tracked uh, by the owner of that content. Those are all, I think, crucial roles uh, for uh, this, uh, this principle. But there are a bunch of developments that are going on in the law and in the marketplace that undermine this idea of exhaustion, undermine this idea of ownership. And they're threatening a really radical shift in the balance between intellectual property and personal property. And the first of those key shifts that I want to describe today is our changing relationship with the copy. The copy has been traditionally the sort of uh, the source of consumer ownership interests, right? Uh, we used to buy our books in hard copy, right? Um, we rented video cassettes or DVDs. We listened to, you know, LPs, then 8-track, then cassettes, then CDs. We had physical copies around. Um, that's how we interacted with copyrighted works. But of course, today distribution looks very different, right? We read books on the Kindle, we stream movies through services like uh, Netflix, we access our music from the cloud or through uh, streaming services. So that unitary physical copy that used to be really the centerpiece of not only the copyright system, but more importantly, consumer uh, ownership interests, has kind of disappeared from the marketplace in many respects. Right? Um, and as we've seen that shift take place from tangible copies to downloads to the cloud to streaming services, we've seen the legal system struggle with how to deal with this new marketplace. Courts struggle answering questions like, does a copy exist at all in this case? Uh, they struggle with uh, questions like um, whether consumer ownership rights are in fact tied to particular tangible copies or if those rights can be disembodied from any particular physical uh, instantiation. The answers to those questions remain largely unresolved, uh, making this, I think, a really crucial point in the history uh, of these issues. So let me give you a couple of examples of, of kind of where the law stands uh, on these questions today. Uh, so the European Court of Justice's decision uh, in the Usesoft case, I think, is the clearest example we have of an embrace of this notion of digital exhaustion, that you can have ownership rights that are not tied uh, to a particular copy. So if you're not familiar with this case, uh, it addressed Usesoft's uh, resale of software licenses to third parties. And the question was whether the right to install and use these software programs could be transferred to a third party independent of any physical medium, right? Without transfer of the, uh, the uh, physical software disk, for example. Now, the court held that under certain circumstances, that kind of transfer is permissible. Um, when the program is initially sold with the consent of the rights holder, when they have reasonable compensation, when the seller deletes any additional copies that they have uh, lying around, when you have a perpetual license, under those sorts of circumstances, this sort of transaction is permissible. Now, this is a software case, right? And so the software directive here is crucial to the reasoning, the extent to which this same kind of approach would apply to other sorts of copyrighted works, I think remains unresolved. We have cases pointing in both uh, directions on that front. But what we're seeing um, is this increasing tension between the realities of the marketplace 
and the legal system's insistence on drawing hard and fast distinctions between physical copies uh, and digital ones, right? We see that in the, the, um, the VOB case under the rental directive, uh, which rejects those sorts of categorical distinctions. Now, in the United States, the picture is even less clear. It's less clear, it's less clear because we only have one case uh, it's a case that's been going on since 2012, and it is actually not really anywhere close to ending. Um, uh, so this is the Capitol Records versus Redigi case. Um, the appellate argument in this case happened actually just about two or three weeks ago. Uh, my co-author was one of the lawyers arguing uh, in favor of Redigi. Um, if you're not familiar with this case, Redigi created a platform for the resale of used digital music. Um, what Redigi did was it created this system that allows uh, users uh, to resell content that they purchase through iTunes. And Redigi's argument is that they don't actually create any new copies. They simply move copies from one location to another uh, because as the files are uploaded packet by packet, uh, they are deleting the original copies from the user's computer. Uh, the trial court was not convinced uh, by this argument. We'll see uh, what the Second Circuit uh, Court of Appeals and probably ultimately the U.S. Supreme Court has to say on this point, right? So this is problem number one. Did I do something wrong here? Thank you. Um, Problem number two, I'm gonna go through the next couple uh, pretty quickly here, right? So problem number two is the redefinition of ownership itself, the redefinition of sales. Um, one of the central questions in exhaustion is whether a transfer of ownership has occurred, whether or not we've seen a sale from one party to another. Um, it used to be it used to be pretty easy to answer this question. So this comes from a US Supreme Court case called Bob's Merrill versus Strauss. This was the first time the US Supreme Court um, dealt with the question of copyright exhaustion. This is a, a label pr printed in the front of a book. If you can't read it, it says, the price of this book at retail is $1 net. No dealer is licensed to sell it at a less price and sale at a less price will be treated as an infringement of the copyright. Um, so this is a sort of proto end user license agreement from 1907, right? And the US Supreme Court looked at this and said, there's no way we're enforcing these terms. You've sold the book, the purchaser owns the book, and they can sell it at whatever price they see fit. So we used to just reject these sorts of things out of hand. Today we live in a different world, right? Uh, we live in a world where courts have become increasingly susceptible to the argument that license terms can transform a transaction from a sale to something else, to something less, right? So when you take the 20,000 words of the iTunes um, uh, license agreement and you turn it into graphic novel form as Robert Sikoriak has done, it's still not a very good read, right? People still, um, they're buying this for the art, they're not buying it for the text. Now the law here is a bit of a mess. We see a distinction in US law between cases that deal with traditional media like compact disc. This is a promotional CD that a record label tried to put out in the world and, contain, and retain control over uh, with this uh, licensing language. The CD is the property of the record company is licensed to the intended recipient for personal use only. Resale or transfer of possession is not allowed. A court looked at that just like it did in 1908 and said, get out of here. We're not enforcing those terms. You can't attach strings to this transaction. Same court uh, on the same day heard this case dealing with AutoCAD software and said, well, yeah, of course, license terms means that this isn't a sale and you don't get to resell the product that you have purchased, right? Now, DRM is another problem in this space. It's a fairly well-rehearsed problem, so maybe we don't need to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but DRM starts off focusing on media, at least has some plausible connection to the reduction of uh, risk of online copyright infringement. Today, DRM is playing a much bigger role in a lot of different spaces. This is my favorite recent example. This is a patent Apple has on an infrared light system 
that disables the recording function on your phone. So if that band has this infrared light emitting from the stage and you try to make a recording, your phone tells you, sorry, we're not going to comply with your requests. Do you own a phone that refuses to record the things that you tell it to record, right? Maybe not. Uh, which brings us to the Internet of Things, right? Um, man, it's so easy to make fun of the Internet of Things. I could do it all day. I'm just going to do it really quickly. Um, does your air freshener need an app? No, no, it doesn't. Um, we, can, we can stop there. Um, why does it take 11 hours to brew a cup of tea? Because you're using a smart tea kettle. That's why, right? Um, you could have like collected kindling and made a fire on your own. This is my favorite smart device, my favorite Internet of Things device, the Smartress. The Smartress is a mattress that, quote, sends an alert to your mobile phone whenever someone is using your bed in a questionable way, which leads to the Bluetooth-enabled pregnancy test, right? Um, I've got like a dozen more of these slides, but um, I'll, <laughs> I'll leave it there, right? What we really should be talking about, instead of how dumb the Internet of Things is, uh, is the Internet of Things that you don't own. And there are lots of examples in which embedded software network capability uh, has undermined your control over the devices that you buy. It started off with sort of big ticket items like Cisco uh, switches and servers. Cisco maintains that if you buy their hardware on the used market, you don't have a license to run their software. You still have to go back to them and pay almost as much uh, as you would for a new device in order uh, to use the thing that you've purchased. But it's trickling down into consumer products. Um, so we saw this in the United States when farm equipment manufacturer John Deere, uh, whose tractors run on software embedded in a dozen or so uh, electronic control units in these um, complicated machines, insists that the farmers do not own the software embedded in these products, right? Uh, in, in the company's words, uh, if I can find the quote here, um, in the company's words, the vehicle owner receives an implied license for the life of the vehicle to operate the vehicle. You don't own your $100,000 tractor. You merely license it. Right? Car companies are starting to say the same things, not surprisingly. Ah, coffee. We, we're coming back to my earlier point about coffee. This is the uh, Keurig coffee maker. Uh, Keurig sells these machines. They also sell very expensive little coffee pods that you put in them to make coffee. They're not happy that there are competing low-cost coffee pods on the market. So what did they do? They invented DRM for coffee. So if you use the off-brand coffee, the machine scans the lid, knows that you're not using the official licensed product, and it refuses to make your coffee, right? And it gives you this little cutesy message on the screen built into the device. Oops, this pack wasn't designed for this brewer. Please try one of the hundreds of packs with our logo, right? If your coffee maker right, at 6 in the morning refuses to make your coffee, you don't own your coffee maker, right? Really quick, uh, another example or two. This is the Revolve. It's a home automation hub put out by Nest, a company owned by Google. They just kind of got sick of making this device, and they didn't want to support it anymore. So they sent out a notice to all of their customers that said, on May 15th, we're just going to shut these things down. We're going to brick them remotely. We're going to flip a little switch in our code, and it's just not going to work anymore. Right? Um, this was the rare case that was so egregious, and they weren't going to give anybody refunds initially. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission intervened, put pressure on the company, and made them give everyone a full refund for this product, right? Um, this is a $300 home automation hub, maybe not the biggest investment you're going to make, but the same principles hold true uh, for you know, your next car purchase, for example, right? Same sorts of things can happen. It's not always quite as stark. This happened just a couple weeks ago. You may have heard about this one. Uh, so Sonos makes um, home speaker systems, and they are internet connected, right? They are software based. And Sonos wanted to roll out a new privacy policy that gave the company more control over the data that it collected, gave it more 
uh, authority to collect information about how you use this product. And the company said, well, look, if you don't sign, if you don't agree to our new privacy policy, over time, the functionality of your device is going to decrease. And eventually, it's just not going to work at all. Right? So here we have a company that sold you maybe thousands of dollars of speakers. And they're essentially holding that product hostage until you agree uh, to their new terms of service. So this issue comes up over and over again all over the place. Uh, from the frivolous, like the $700 Juicero home juicer, which uh, I was happy to see failed. Um, although the people who bought this thing, uh, I don't know what good it's going to do them once the servers are shut down. Um, so from the frivolous, frivolous to um, things that our lives actually depend on, right? Um, we have hundreds of thousands of smart pacemakers that are um, implanted in people's bodies and without the ability to understand how the code works uh, and to make changes to the underlying software code in these devices, these patients are at risk. So this issue of ownership is not going anywhere. Uh, it is going to continue to uh, surface in new and unexpected places. And I think the legal system needs uh, to develop a new sort of framework, a new vocabulary, so it can respond thoughtfully to uh, these sorts of problems. So I'm out of time, uh, but thanks so much for your time and attention.